So in the second part of Lecture 5 in JavaScript, we're going to talk about common APIs you will encounter when uh, using JavaScript in the browser, and then also uh, what event-driven and asynchronous programming is. So let's get started with the, the APIs that you're probably going to use a lot. Uh, the first API that, that is interesting, or which is actually a set of APIs, is called the browser object model. And it allows uh, you access information that, that the browser has about the website and about the uh, the browser um, itself. And so the way this works is that there's this global object called window, and within, within window we have all those different things that are, are interesting to, to use. So let's actually go uh, to the browser, to the console, and see how this works. Okay, so here we have the browser open, we have the um, toolval, and here we can say window, and it, it'll already give us a lot of things to, to look at. Um, so let's say we want to have the screen, and then on the screen, um, there's a lot of things we can look at here. Let's say that, uh, we want to have the height of the screen. So in, in this particular case, the height of the screen is 800. Let's move the, this up a little bit, and okay, it's still 800. And then let's say window dot. Oh, and actually, uh, all the things that you, you have within window are usually also uh, prefixed in its own. So you can just say screen dot. And I'll have the same information. Oh yeah, then we have avail height. Let's see, avail. Oh yeah, so the available height is something else than the height. So if I make this shorter, okay. So for some reason, this is not doing what I wanted, but usually it will give you some more information on that. Uh, let's go to another. Let's go, for instance, to location. So here in location, you have something like the host name. The host name is exactly what you would expect. It's, it's the host name of what you see here. Uh, location gives you even more. Say uh, location dot uh, the, the href. It gives, it gives you the, the full um, URL you see on top of here. Uh, you can have location dot the path name. And we'll give you the, only the path that comes after uh, the domain, for instance, here. Uh, and so on and so forth. So location is an interesting thing to, to get. Uh, let's see what, what else we have here. The protocol, you can get search and replace. Yeah. What might be interesting here, uh, the origin. We had that before. Search. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. So here you also get the search function, for instance. So you look at type off here. I think this is actually a string. Yes. So here you, you all, uh, only get the search uh, parameter query, and this might be interesting to use if uh, you have a dynamic site that deals with parameters. And then you have uh, what else do we have here? Uh, let's say we have the navigator. The navigator is another object that, that is pretty powerful. Uh, can give us things like the user agent. Uh, it shows us what will be uh, sent over uh, over HTTP, for instance, as a user agent. Uh, you can have things like um, the system language. Well, usually, this should be in here. Oh no, in this case, not. Um, let's see, the platform shows us it's a Mac with an Intel. Uh, and if you look at the Navigator itself, it's, a, it's an object that you can look at, right? And see what, what else is in there. And there's a lot of information on the underlying browser. Oh yeah, oh, okay, so it's not system languages, it's a, it's a set of languages. So that has already changed the last time I've used it. So if you go to Navigator and Languages, Oh yeah, so the main language is English. If you go to languages, it gives you all the, the list of languages that, that are supported by the, the operating system. Okay. And then you have the document that, that uh, is actually the API for the document object model. So that's something we're going to look at in a little bit. Uh, you have something uh, like the, the pop-up box that we saw before. So if we say, we can say window.alert, right? But we can also just say alert. So everything that is in, almost everything that is in window has, has been has uh, also been put in the global scope. So again, here we can say uh, alert. Oh, yeah, here it is. 
And you can also work with timing in the browser. So there's uh, something called um, set interval or set timeout. So if you say window.set timeout, what it does is it takes uh, some event, let's say. Oh, yeah, I already have something here. So I can pass it a function that takes an event. Right now, that's not, we're going to actually just log the event. And we're just going to alert something here. And this will happen every 3,000 milliseconds, meaning every three seconds. So, oh, no, sorry, not every. So set timeout means it'll happen once after 3,000 milliseconds equals three seconds. So we hit enter here. This is the, the event ID that comes back. And after three seconds, uh, whatever code I had was passed on here. Oh yeah, it, it might actually be that that set timeout does not give you any any event information. That that's possible actually. So and then we can have something like set interval. And what set interval does is is uh, it, it also deals with timing information. It provides you an, a utility to execute a function every n seconds. So let's not pass a parameter in this case. Let's just say um, alert. And this happens every, uh, let's say, five seconds, right? And then let's pass 5,000 here, 5,000 milliseconds. Now the, every, uh, now this is something you, you need to remember actually. And now this will happen every five seconds unless I reload the page in this case or I clear the interval. I can also say, so let's see if we can make this happen. Window, yeah, it's gonna be annoying. Dot clear interval. And then I pass the 61 here. Okay, and now this will not happen again. Okay, so in this case, I just pass the, 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 the ID to, uh, 61. Uh, what you will do in the future, you will just uh, let's co copy this. You just say, let's say interval ID, for instance, right? And now interval ID is this ID, and you can say, so okay, this happens every five seconds. You can say window dot clear interval. Okay. Oops. And we will say interval ID, and it will look there. So this is the the browser optic model. It's not standardized over all the browsers. Uh, however, most of the browsers uh, have found a common API that they they want to use within that. Okay. So next, what we have is also interesting. It's uh, about storing data. So what we already heard before uh, is cookies. And uh, what's maybe new is the idea of having permanent storage or also ephemeral storage within our browser. So those two things I'll call web, web storage. And specifically, I'm referring to local and session storage here. Now, what you have in cookies, um, similar to the, what you have in web storage, are key value pairs that are based on strings. In cookies, um, the well, you could actually have any any arbitrary string, but the contract is that you have uh, semicolon separated strings. And the difference between the web storage that we have and cookies is that web storage usually has a, a, a lot larger uh, capacity for storing data. And cookies will be transferred on every request. So every time you send an HTTP request on that domain, uh, the cookie will be part of that request. Whereas if you use local storage or any sort of web storage, it will be only part of, of uh, your local computer and will not be sent over unless it's being done explicitly by the programmer. So, and there are two things here. We have the local storage uh, that stores the data in the browser um, and then which has no expiration date. And then we have session storage that expires as soon as you, as you close uh, the tab or the browser, okay? And if you have a, a look at the example on the right, the API is the same thing. Uh, you have uh, the storage, uh, either the window.local storage or window.session storage, and you can access it over um, 
uh, assigning keys or deleting keys with values. And, and the only difference is uh, the ephemeral property. In session, session storage, as soon as you close the, the, the tab, uh, this storage is gone, whereas local storage will, will persist. And it has no official expiration date. However, uh, you as a user of the browser can clear your local storage. And now we come to, to an interesting part of uh, the API you can interact with the JavaScript, namely the document object model. So the document object model is also something we heard before. So the markup that we have um, HTML is being parsed to an internal representation that the browser can then use uh, to, to paint things on the screen. And this is a document object model. It's a tree structure of the elements you have. And what we can do now is we can, with JavaScript, we can manipulate the DOM. And there are a lot of things we can do. Uh, at first, what we need to do is we want to retrieve certain elements based on certain properties. So this is the, these are the examples we have on the right side. You can use the ID, you can use tag names, class names. Uh, you can even use it in, in more recent versions of JavaScript and browsers. You can use query selectors uh, to get to certain elements of the document object model. And then you can change elements. You can change existing um, nodes in the, in the tree. You can insert new nodes into the tree so you can manipulate, you can remove, append, and create. And Obviously, uh, because it's a it's a um, a tree structure, you can traverse uh, based on the element structure that you have in there. And uh, yeah, on the right side here, you see a few examples of, uh, of of these of this API. But let's actually go to again here to have a look. So for this, I'm gonna use one of the browser APIs. Um, let me see. I think it was like, yeah, so you have access to the history and you can say, you can call a function here called history.back. And let's go back to the overview here. Right here, this is my overview screen with uh, some of the old courses that I have in here. And what I, I may want to do, let's, um, I may, maybe want to just go through all of these things here. So let's inspect these elements here and see what they might have in common. So, decrease this a little bit. Yes, there you go. Now let's have a look what we have here. Okay, so, we have certain elements here. Uh, yeah, so this is something that, that looks interesting. We have th these elements that have uh, this class called card body. So let's actually go ahead and let's get all the elements. The console, let's go back here. And let's increase, I ignore those things here. It's just a uh, info. Warnings, there you go. And let's say we want to get, we want to get all the elements that have the class card box. So we say, it's just to be, we say document dot get element, and then you have different uh, selectors here. Let's say we want to have a class name, and the class name we want is card body. Okay, and we look at elements here. Uh, it's a, a collection of 36 elements, okay, with all different sorts of, of properties. And now let's say, and it's a list, it's an array of, of those elements. And now let's say we, we want to uh, add something to those elements. Uh, for that, we, let's, let's iterate over these elements. Let's say we're going to do a for loop. We want to say for let uh, card box off. And then we want to have that list. Well, what was the name again? I think it's just called the elements. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And let's just say we, we want to just change the border right now. So something quite boring. I just want to say, so let's just say we have this element cart box and we want to say, um, Oh, 
border, and then we say one pixel, or let's say actually five, four pixels solid and red. Uh, something visible that we can immediately see. And let's actually close this up. Uh, it didn't actually happen. Why did it not happen? Let me see again. And let, let's change something else. Just to uh, say we want to change. Class um, class list. Let's just add another class property. Uh, let's add the class property uh, lecture five. Oh, uh, apologies for that. So we don't want to have that on style. We want to have that on the cart box. Okay. So now if we go to the elements again. We have a look at all the card boxes. Those are all the cards. See, so now every class that has a card body, we, we added this this class lecture five. But actually, what I wanted to to add was the style. So maybe I can go here again and just say style or. Let's try for one element. Let's go ahead and um, just get one of these elements here. It has an ID. And then console. Let's say that so element equals document dot get element by ID. And then some element dot style. Let's see what that is. So the issue is that that the style API for the elements is, is not necessarily the same as the CSS they want to have. See, so for instance, background color would not be background dash color; it would be like this. So this is something that you, you should be aware of. And the same with the border. Interestingly, border bottom color. Let's just try border color then. No, oh, the border should actually work. So let me try, let me try this again. See, no, it doesn't change. Oh yeah, oh, it does change, interesting. Okay, why didn't it change before? Let me try this again. Let me say, let me go back to the loop here and say border equals four pixels, solid, red. Maybe it was a semicolon that threw it off. Oh yeah, there it is. So now every element of the, uh, that had the class that we looked at before, now gets this border. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show before. I think what I, I messed up before is that I added a semicolon here. Let me see if that's actually true. Yeah, there it is. So this was the culprit. So so this does not work. Let's uh let's change it to let's say black and dashed. Okay, there you go. And it immediately changes those things. Okay, so that's interesting. And also do is uh, we can add elements based on this. So let's say with, with the with the same thing here and say, well, I want to just add something here. So let's say we want to add a heading of order four. So for this, uh, I have to create a new element uh, head heading. There's a document dot create element. Let's say H three. Oops. It's not what I wanted. Because that now is empty. Uh, let's remove this here for the time being. Um, and now heading uh, should have uh, some inner text. So the text should be just some random 
and then heading, and then let, let's just actually add, or let's uh, use this. Let's use the cardboard ID, card box ID. Okay. Well, I also want to have the card box dot ID in here. Okay. Oh, well, we weren't done yet. And, and now we want to actually introduce this new element that we created into the card box. We say card box dot uh, append child and then say heading. Now we're actually done. Okay, so now every, if you look at this here, every of these elements now has these this H3 element in here. And if you go to inspect here, we can actually see that this exists, okay? And we can do, so, so this element can, can look however you want it to look, actually. And we can do even more uh, interesting things. Uh, we can just completely change the way that cardbox looks like. We can just say, well, cardbox, I want to just overwrite what the HTML looks like and just say cardbox.innerHTML. And now, yeah, here it shows me one of the examples, right? And I can just say, something random and as I do that it just completely changes what happens here right so so the whole card box so it, it seems like this will these were all card boxes and we just removed everything that, that was in there so if you look at the at the side here it's gonna be very empty yeah but as soon as I reload my page it's all back to normal right so we're, we're just changing the we're not changing the, the markup that is being served, we're changing the markup that is being shown within um, the current view. So now we're back to normal. But what I wanted to show you is that uh, with JavaScript, you now have the ability to change a lot of things in very interesting ways. Um, so if we, let's say we combine this um, with the window um, set interval opportunities. And what we can do, let's, uh, let's go here again. And let's just say we have the same as we had before. This is going to be part of a function. I'm going to say it's going to be a, fu a function called um, change order. Change card box order. Or just change element border. And then we, get, uh, we give it a class name. Right. So. Here we say uh, elements or let, um, or actually we can say const here. So I'm gonna change elements equals document element by class name, class name. And we can, so this is maybe a bit too drastic. We just say uh, that style, that border, and then we say uh, four pixels solid. Dash is actually nice, dash is red. No, don't do the semicolon. That was my, my problem before. Um, and this should be it. And actually, let's just pass on a different color every time. Let's say this is a color. So people can pass a color. But the standard is red. So now we have this function. We can call the function once. Say, want to have it for, um, is it cart box? I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> Let's inspect this element again. Um, ah, it was cart body, actually. Okay. So, it's cart body. I'm, yeah, card dash body. And let's just pass nothing here. Then it's gonna change it all to red. If we pass it uh, black, change it all to black or whatever color, right? Different sorts of colors. Um, room probably is a color 
Yeah, it is. And uh, now we can do uh, interesting things. We can just say, uh, let's actually define um, global variable here. It's just I and it's zero. And then we say window dot set timeout. Well, actually, no, set interval. And let's say we want to just call this function change ln or before we do that, let's just have another global variable called colors. Let's define just a few colors, right? So say we have a color black, blue, um, azure, maroon. What else do we want? I don't know. Let's have actual red again. Um, let's have, I don't know, let's have yellow, let's have green, right, and so on. And so let's have a function. Actually, let's have a function that randomly picks one of these colors. Oh, okay. Um, I actually looked this up, JavaScript, random number. Um, wait, no parameters? Okay, there you go, that's what I need. And I need a random number between, um, let's do it just inside the window, dot set interval. And every, whatever n seconds, we just call, we just get a random color from here. So we just say, um, change element border, right? Um, I'm gonna st stick with the card body, but here we're gonna say what well, colors and then not 10 but colors dot length oops there you go yep and here let's say we do this every two seconds and this actually lets our const actually const interval ID. Or maybe we'll do it again. Say let. Okay, let's see if this actually works. So, yeah, so you can see here every two seconds the border color changes. Okay, yeah, that's, that's kind of neat. All right, so let's actually clear that interval. Let's just say clear interval, interval ID. Okay, and now it should be gone. So let's wait two seconds and see. Yeah, there it is. Now we're stuck with blue, uh, sorry, with red. Okay, let's go back. So as you can see, there are interesting things you can do with the document object model. And uh, in the exercise for A2, you will see different ways of, of doing those things. Uh, just keep in mind that if you introduce those those updates into the document object model, um, there are certain things to keep in mind for accessibility. Um, and there are a few things that, that uh, I've, I've listed here. Uh, for instance, that frequently updating the, the document object model can confuse certain screen readers, especially if you do it on different uh, parts of the, of the site, because then the updates may, may not be able uh, if the screen reader is in high magnification. And um, also keep in mind that certain updates may be invisible uh, to certain users. So if you introduce a red border uh, to, to say there's an error in here, uh, just be aware that in the text browser, that red, that red border is just not visible. So maybe introduce uh, a different sort of, a sort of update uh, in addition to, to just having a color update. And there are certain guidelines that, that you, can, you can kind of live with to, to make this better. So for instance, if the content updates for more than five seconds, then provide an ability to control that update. Um, and then also if you, 
uh, do updates more frequently, inform the users uh, of the changes, set the focus differently, highlight the, the, the part of the page in a certain way. Um, and then there's something that is a term from the accessibility gu guidelines for rich internet applications, uh, ARIA. It's called the live region. So I put a link down there. If you're interested in what live regions means, uh, you can look up how to do this. Uh, and in assignment two, actually, uh, we'll work a little bit with these uh, live regions. And uh, last but not least, provide uh, maybe an alternative to the, to the dynamic uh, aspects of the site, uh, namely in a, a static way. So that, that's, kind of, that's kind of the last resort. And uh, obviously, careful testing for those things are necessary. Um, you can proxy it with a text browser, as we've seen uh, previously. Uh, you can actually use a screen reader, depending on also who your audience is. But uh, I, I feel like those are things that you should do. OK, and now we come to the last part of the lecture, uh, namely event-driven and asynchronous programming. And what is meant by event-driven programming is that the, the flow of the program is, is determined by responding to, to any sort of event that happens from a user perspective. So every time a user does something on the page, uh, what you can do with JavaScript is you, you can react to the event. What that means is that you don't have a, a main function, as you, as you might think of in a, in a other imperative programming language that just runs the program through. If you think that just putting JavaScript on your page might be your main function, you could think of it that way. But what you're actually doing in most cases is uh, you're, you're reacting to the load events of the page. The page is loading and you're just reacting to that. Okay, so the programs you're writing are actually driven by the user events you have. And now there are multiple ways of attaching these so-called callbacks for the user, of, for, for JavaScript to, to react to. Uh, on the left side is something that, that we've already seen previously. You can, in the, in the markup of the browser, uh, you can say on click, and then you, you uh, in this on click event, you can, you can just add some JavaScript. So let's maybe go to, a um, bit of a simpler page, let's go to the, the course website. And let's just go to the, the headings here. Okay, right here, right here. Now I can just add an R click event. I can just say uh, on click and just let what I for alert. Uh, Clicked here. Oops, this will not work. So, click here on. Let's do it. Right. So if I click here, see, we already have that. I can even probably do some more. I can um. So I think clicked here on this dot inner text oops forgot to close notifications there you go okay so if I click here okay I already, and I have both but uh, you can also access information on the element so if you, if you use this within the context of of an event, uh, you will be in the context of that element, and you can use properties of that element. So I think that's interesting and good to know. Okay, let's go back. And uh, the other way of doing it, and that's the the I would say better way because it ha you have a nicer separation of markup and dynamic behavior, is selecting the elements that you want and adding event listeners to those elements. So on the right side here, you, you see you can, you can retrieve the button by, by some selector, and you can, you, there are different ways of adding event listeners to that. And uh, there are different sorts of events that you can look at. Uh, here's a, a list of them. Uh, I think mostly we're going to work with the click events. Maybe we're going to work with uh, some form change events and stuff like that. But there's a whole different and larger list of events that you can react to in JavaScript. And here's just a, a selection of those. And oh yeah, so what we've seen here is that you can pass a function that 
then gets called once this event is being uh, is, is being triggered. And that's already part of asynchronous programming. So every time you, you pass this function w within this event listener, you asynchronously wait for something to happen. And similarly, you could think of uh, sending an HTTP request in that way. So if you send an HTTP request, uh, you provide a callback, so what's called this, this higher order function that then does something once it comes back. And now if you send multiple requests and you have multiple asynchronous computations waiting for you, uh, then uh, let's say in more classical APIs like uh, the XML HTTP request API you see on the left side here, uh, what happens is something called callback hell. And what this means is that every time you successfully uh, deal with, with, with some asynchronous request and you want to send the next asynchronous request and you want to chain those things, uh, then you have to, uh, you go, you go have a callback and a callback and a callback. So you have an increasingly nested callback chains. And th this is what, what we call callback hell. And there's even a, its own website dedicated to, to that that kind of explains uh, why this was so painful. But mostly it was painful because it gets very hard to read and very hard to reason about. So a more modern uh, approach of dealing with asynchronous programs is this thing called promises. And if you look at HTTP, there's also a new API that deals uh, with HTTP uh, within this promise paradigm. And the fetch API um, does that for you. So promises in general are a wrapper around asynchronous computations, meaning that a promise just represents a value, uh, presents how to get a value, and it goes through uh, different stages. So the first stage that you have is the initial state, it's pending. You say, I wanna have this resource, I wanna have this, this computation, this object, and it tells you, well, because this is a promise, um, we're gonna start with the initial state, which is pending, and then as soon as the other states come in, we're gonna notify you. So very similar to, to the callback idea, but the nice thing is that in the way that promises are built up, you can more easily uh, chain those things together to look like synchronous events. And that makes it easier to understand what's going on or what you want to actually express within the computation. So um, the promise stages are pending, fulfilled, and rejected. So th these are the stages you, you can go through in a promise. And on the right bottom side here, uh, you can see the API for promises. So you, you can even build your own promise if you have a computation that is, that is delayed for some reason. However, that is not the focus of this lecture. Uh, I just want you to understand how to use these promises and what they do in the background. So if you look at the example on the top here, we have this uh, fetch that just uh, sends an HTTP request to get the, the movies.json uh, file. And then the first promise, uh, if you say dot then, so what fetch does is it returns a promise to you. If you say dot then, um, the callback that you register in here uh, will will say, well, I get the, this response, do something with it. And in this case, the response, dot JSON, is also a promise. So we have to chain another then on top of it, and then we actually get to the data, and we can lock the data somewhere. And the, the catch operation is is a short shortcut for having a, a then that leads to a failure, meaning that here we can, in the end, catch it, uh, if, if there's an issue with a promise. And there's an interesting special syntax that you can work with promises that is called async await. Before we go into that, let, let's actually uh, go through this example with that we have here. Um, let's just get this string here. And let's just work with this. So let's go back here and say, uh, I want to have the response, okay, and I want to fetch this resource. Um, let's, let's say const username, it's just my username on GitHub. Okay, now this response, as you can see here, is a promise, okay? And it's already resolved. So th this already shows you the state of the promise. So what we can do here now is we can say response uh, dot then, right? And what we can do, so what we get is if you look at the API here, uh, we will get 
a, a response that we can call JSON on, and then on the JSON, uh, we can actually, the JSON itself is also a promise. If you say now response dot uh, JSON promise, or can we just count this response, response dot JSON. Okay, so JSON, this is, again, this is, again, a promise, right? And now if we say response, um, now we have the actual data, we can say console.log data. Oh, sorry, I forgot the, the then here. What happened here? Oh, this should already get me what I wanted. Not sure why it didn't. Let's try this again by just, yeah, just doing this. Let's go all the way back. Let's just say fetch. Let's say then. Then oh. that should actually work. Let me see. There you go. I, I only had the the console log not being shown here. So if, if you go back, actually, we'll probably see. Yeah. So here we now we, we have uh, the object that is being returned. Now, if we look again at our last slide here, there's a special syntax you can use, and it's called async await. And it's a, a different way of dealing with promises to make them uh, to make it look like it's it's more of a synchronous operation. Although you, by having this keyword async and await, you know it's an asynchronous synchronous operation. But since that there there are these chains of, of computations you need to do, this is a much easier and more natural way to understand what's going on. So, and yeah, what async does is it it's a keyword that that wraps around the promise, and uh, so, so the wraps around the value and makes a promise out of it. So as soon as you say something is async, you automatically uh, wrap a promise around the value that's being computed. And what await does is it waits until a promise is resolved and then it returns the actual value uh, within this asynchronous function. So if we go back to what we did back here and let's um, just copy paste the same fetch here. Okay. And yeah, let's remove the info again. And now let's say, um, oh yeah, before we do that, let's just say username again. Yeah, exactly. And now instead of instead of going through the whole promise chain we saw before, we just say uh, await. We just say let. Um, user object, right? What was the name here? Just have the same thing, GitHub response. GitHub response equals await fetch. Okay, now what will happen is uh, before we go on with this computation, it will actually block here. It, it won't block. It, it will look like it will block here until something goes back. Uh, because that's how the control flow works here. It will just deal with the control flow differently. But this only works if the whole function you have is already in async. Okay. Because then this is what is expected. So this is a not this is still a non blocking operation. This is just a different way of viewing this chaining of, of different asynchronous computations. 
So now we have GitHub response, and now we can say the user or user object equals await uh, oops, GitHub response dot JSON. Okay. Now if we go to user object, we can see we can art we already have the object here. Okay. And personally, I feel that this is a much nicer way of of dealing with with asynchronous computation. This is actually our last slide. But before we actually finish, I wanted to show one more thing that I forgot about before this event listener thingy here. So because that's a, the, a nicer way of, of actually dealing with events. So let's go to the site again. And yeah, here we have different sorts of H2s, right? We have this is an H2, this is an H2, and so on and so forth. Um, what I want to do is I want to attach some, some event to it. So the same way we did before, but now I just do uh, const headings documents dot get element by name. Oh wait, not by name. Um, that by tag name. That's what I want. Oh, that probably won't work. Great. Okay, so now we have this heading two that has uh, five elements. Great. Now what I'm going to do is I can again say for h2s uh, of heading two, and uh, now I can do certain things. All right, I can now say h2s. All right, let's actually call it just h2 dot and. Let me just go back here. I can just say add event listener. Okay, add event listener. And, and that actually receives an event. And I say, um, oh, wait, so what was it? Oh, yeah, no. Click. On every click, do something. Just say alert, do something, right? As I close this, it added the event listeners here. So if I go back to the site and I click on every of the H, any of the H2s here, right, it says do something. Now I can do that again. And um, I can something more, a bit more meaningful. I can say you are clicking on um, and then have the name right. Dollar. Also, much easier. Console log the actual event. I can also do different things, right? I can say um, this dot uh, style dot border equals. Oops, let's not do the same thing again. Nope. Okay, this should be it. Hopefully I didn't make any mistake here. We'll, we'll see in a second. So as I click here, I have to do something because we are, so, so what you have to understand is if you see add event listener, you're actually adding uh, to a list of event listeners that are happening. If you want the old event to not be there anymore, you have to actually remove it or not add it in the first place, obviously. Okay. Oh, an undefined. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay undefined why am i doing something oh because i'm in a different context that's right uh that is totally my bad but if i do here info then i lock so what, what i did is i i locked the actual event and what we get is we get this object uh with type mouse event 
you get all sorts of interesting things here. You get uh, the mouse position, you get um, target, you get offsets, you get movement information. Oh, and there it is, the, the two element. That, that's what I actually I was actually looking for. So um, let's do this again. Let's just copy paste this and start from scratch because uh, I think what I want to show you is, is important. Okay, that's nice. But I need um, having two. There you go. And I have this. And then instead of this, I will go through um, event dot. Well, what was it? Man, I already forgot. Let's just. JavaScript, mouse event, API. I think it was a two element, but let me just two element. No. Uh, it doesn't show me what I want to see, unfortunately. Um, let's just do this first. There you go. One time. Oh, okay. And if we do this, we get the actual mouse event. Oh yeah, it was two element. Two element has everything that we need. There you go, we have style. Okay, so let's do this again. What happened? Oh yeah, there it is. Um, instead of doing this, I want to do event dot to element dot style dot border. That's what I want to do. There you go. Okay, now we get to sit. Oh no, why is it not happening? Did it not add the event listener from before? Oh, it didn't. Why not? Okay, there it is. Okay. So you see, this is this can be very confusing. Uh, but what I just wanted to show you here is that within uh, an event listener, you get this parameter called events, and through this event, you get a lot of information that was happening through through that event bubble, and you can also access the the element that the event was targeted at, and you can uh, do something with that element again. So if I go down here, I think that I don't have any H twos left. Oh yeah, there it is one. Okay, and I can, I can do stuff with that element. Okay, and that actually concludes our uh, lecture. Um, yeah, so what we've heard is, is about asynchronous uh, computations and programming in JavaScript, but event-driven programming that, that is asynchronous programming. And I think with that, you are well-equipped to do um, exercise, uh, the assignment number two.